There he is. Hi. 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 Dr. Belfer. Good to be here this afternoon. Wonderful. Well, it's great to have you here. It's actually the morning for us here in Reno, Nevada. Um, but I am like, so excited to bring you all, as I was saying, Dr. Myron Belfer. He is a true pioneer in global mental health. Um, Dr. Belfer is a professor of psychiatry in the Department of Psychiatry at Children's um, Hospital in Boston. He's also at Harvard Medical School, and he's a senior associate in psychiatry at the Children's Hospital of Boston. He is a child and adolescent psychiatrist and is also on the affiliated faculty of the Harvard Center for the Developing Child. Um, Dr. Belfer is also former senior advisor um, at the World Health Organization for several years. Um, for me personally, he's a mentor and he's been instrumental in our work around the world on hope. He's really helped refine um, hopeful minds and, and has been a key just um, mentor and leader for me in the space. So I'm so excited to have him here. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Belfer. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you, Catherine, for that introduction. Uh, I'm here today to talk with you about the global impact of uh, COVID on mental health. Uh, I would argue that uh, COVID is unprecedented uh, in our lifetime. Uh, perhaps the pandemic of 1918 uh, or the genocide that we've experienced in many parts of the world over the past decades uh, have affected the uh, same numbers of people uh, in terrible ways. Uh, but uh, the impact of COVID is uh, unique in many ways. It's unique because it's been sustained over time. Uh, when we think of 9-11, uh, when we think of a tsunami or earthquake, uh, they're usually time limited uh, and people have an idea of when the end will come. Uh, with COVID, uh, it's been indeterminate so far. In other words, we hope uh, that it's coming to an end. Uh, but we really don't know. Uh, uh, also, uh, there's the, the question of the unknown. In other words, uh, uh, often we know who the enemy is. In other words, in, in a way, it makes it easier for us. But here, uh, the virus can't be seen by the ordinary individual. Uh, and so that makes it uh, uh, strange, particularly with younger people, in other words, who have a hard time conceptualizing uh, foreign objects. Uh, also, in other words, we don't we feel helpless. In other words, the the people we've turned to in the past as experts have not seemed to have the answers that we want. Uh, and even in the best medical facilities in the wealthiest countries, the mortality rate uh, was extraordinary. Uh, likewise, in other words, uh, uh, in countries that didn't have the resources and in groups, marginalized groups in any country. Uh, they've been impacted uh, uh, in greater numbers. In other words, so that people who previously did not have access to health care uh, suffer the most, in other words, and are marginalized uh, uh, in their ability to be able to get back into the mainstream. Uh, this is going to be a long-term uh, problem. We had uh, a number of mental health studies. The, the interest in mental health in the world uh, is unprecedented at this time. Uh, it's largely because we've seen a, a spike in suicides among people who we didn't expect uh, would be vulnerable. Uh, so healthcare workers, frontline responders, people we thought of as being very strong and being able to tolerate all sorts of uh, adverse uh, experiences uh, have killed themselves. Uh, they've, uh, uh, they've been unable to handle the stresses associated uh, uh, with COVID. The same is true in families. Uh, we see an uptick uptick in uh, abuse, in other words, uh, conflict at home, uh, inability for children uh, to uh, be able to access uh, colleagues or friends, in other words, uh, to be able to uh, associate with others in normal ways. Uh, and this will have uh, uh, consequences later for their socialization. Uh, children have been out of school now as a result of COVID and the pandemic. Uh, uh, the impact of this uh, being out of school is yet to be determined. Um, will children be able to catch up educationally? That's important. Uh, but more important, what will it do to social relationships? What will it, be, what will it do to trusting uh, institutions uh, that are charged with the protection and the support uh, of individuals? Um, 
I think that uh, we have a lot to learn from COVID uh, about mental health, uh, about the building of healthcare systems that will be more responsive. Uh, healthcare systems were totally unprepared uh, for this pandemic. Um, and we must not forget the lessons that uh, uh, we've learned uh, during the pandemic for the development of healthcare systems that will be responsive. I hope, in other words, that mental health, in other words, will be included in other words, in the development of these uh, newer, uh, more responsive uh, uh, systems uh, for healthcare. We have to be able to uh, get back to a society, in other words, that will embody uh, mutual respect, uh, trust, uh, and the ability uh, to have a future outlook, a future uh, perspective on things. Uh, we need to build hope in other words, for the future. Uh, and this is a daunting task. In other words, uh, we, as a result of COVID, we have so many people who've lost their jobs, lost their livelihood, uh, lost their self-respect, uh, have uh, been unable, in other words, to feel uh, as functional as they were in the past. Uh, how do we heal this? It's a major challenge. Uh, it's not simply in the medical field. Uh, it's in the field of uh, uh, related to all of us, education, uh, social support, uh, every, every aspect of society needs to come together uh, to be able to support individuals. Uh, we cannot deny, in other words, uh, the impact of COVID. In other words, to think uh, once uh, uh, COVID has ameliorated uh, that all is over would be a major mistake. Um, because I think the consequences of COVID will be with us uh, mentally, in other words, for a long period of time. Uh, can we rebuild trust? Uh, can we uh, feel confident in authorities? Uh, can we feel confident in the healthcare system that will have the, the resources to, uh, to help us? As a psychiatrist, in other words, my concern certainly uh, is not only with uh, the people who've been impacted by uh, suicide, which is a terrible uh, loss and tragedy uh, for so many families, uh, but the overall morbidity and mortality that's been associated with COVID uh, has touched so many people, so many people uh, throughout the world. Uh, it's almost rare now to not know someone who's been impacted by COVID. Uh, either uh, su surviving the illness itself, in other words, uh, or being able to mourn. When we speak about mourning, one of the other consequences of COVID, in other words, during the height of the pandemic, uh, has been the absence of the ability to adequately mourn individuals who've been lost. Uh, so we haven't been able to have church services. We haven't been able to have uh, services uh, that would help to heal the loss of an individual. Uh, I know personally uh, for some families uh, that this has been a lingering trauma, uh, the inability to be able to access religious uh, authorities in person, uh, the inability to go to the cemetery, uh, the inability to simply grieve in a way uh, that allows one to heal. Uh, so this is not only in the area of mental health, in other words, but it's in the area of society being able to support individuals uh, to be able to look better, look more uh, towards the future uh, with hope, uh, uh, with uh, hopefulness, uh, with the ability uh, to feel uh, good about themselves uh, and about the society uh, that they uh, that they live in. Um, I'm hoping, in other words, that as we move forward, uh, we'll be able to think about ways uh, to particularly support children. I think we have a lot to learn uh, in relation to the mental health of children. Uh, young children uh, will have experienced the, uh, the grief of their parents, in other words, the uh, isolation uh, that's uh, unprecedented, uh, the absence of solutions uh, to problems that they have looked forward to. Uh, I worry, in other words, that we're not talking about uh, simple anxiety disorders or ADHD or uh, other kinds of more formal disorders, uh, but we're talking about a disruption uh, of normal development uh, in these children. Uh, and what will the consequences be? Uh, we know uh, from uh, research 
uh, the children at, at various stages have a limited capacity to kind of catch up, in other words, and uh, what will we do? Uh, what kinds of interventions can we develop to help children catch up, uh, to get back into the mainstream, uh, to get uh, to regain a healthy trajectory in their own uh, lives? So those are some of my thoughts about the global impact of COVID. Uh, I, uh, Catherine had asked me if I had some examples of really great programs uh, that help people. Well, there are individual programs, in other words, uh, in China and uh, uh, the U.S. and elsewhere uh, that have aimed to help healthcare workers by uh, connecting them uh, through electronic resources uh, uh, with their families, uh, through uh, Zoom. Everybody knows about Zoom these days, uh, ways in which people have uh, fostered connections. However, uh, these examples are limited. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the people who are able to access a lot of these uh, interventions are people who are better off to begin with. Uh, they have the economic and social wherewithal uh, to be able to take advantage uh, of these programs. Uh, so uh, I think we're challenged to really find good programs that are easily accessible uh, and don't require resources uh, that may be very hard for individuals uh, uh, to gain. Uh, on this side, in other words, I think that uh, uh, we, in fact, have learned a lot. In other words, uh, uh, the use of Zoom, uh, uh, the use of distance learning, uh, uh, the, the various experiments in education uh, may all hopefully uh, give us some insight into what we can do better uh, in the future in a number of different uh, domains. Uh, most importantly, I think we all have to have hope uh, that the future future is going to be better and uh, uh, that we will have learned uh, from this experience. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to take some questions from Catherine uh, or comments. Wonderful. I mean, yeah, you gave such a great overview in terms of how cross-cutting the impact of COVID is in so many ways that I didn't even think about. And like you say, the grief and the separation um, and experiencing loss and not being able to connect or have services or be with loved ones. I mean, that in and of itself is really, is pretty massive and so much part of the healing um, journey and experience. Um, so really great points. And I think as we look at creating a happier world and healthier world and heal from this moving forward, we really have to think on it such a broad way. Um, you've been involved in mental health for so long, do you think? Um, and I, I think, you know, 20 years ago, we wouldn't have even been having the conversation necessarily of mental health in this, um, at least in a limited capacity. Do you think that it's changed? Do you think that now we're talking, like, do you think this will aid in us all talking about mental health and physical health and how it's connected? I hope so. I, I think uh, uh, one of the reasons I'm hopeful in that regard is that the, the mental health issues have so impacted the healthcare community, in other words, uh, that it's very difficult for uh, healthcare providers to ignore uh, their personal psychological experience, their personal mental health problems during this period of time. Uh, and uh, so I think that may translate uh, into the development of programs that will be sustained uh, in the healthcare sector uh, that will include uh, mental health. And, uh, and the same is true, I think, in the education sector, uh, which in many ways has been devastated by COVID. In other words, uh, uh, totally unpredictable uh experiences and uh going back into the classroom for teachers uh they're going to have as many worries about mental health concerns as they will uh about the curriculum in their education in other words uh, uh and uh, for families uh, that previously may have been able to ignore uh mental health uh the experience of isolation uh, the experience of confinement, uh, the, the precipitous loss of jobs and income and uh, other kinds of security uh, will certainly shake a lot of people to think much more uh, about their mental health and how to preserve it in the future. 
Yeah, absolutely. And we know with the work on hope that it's our ability to kind of re-navigate or set a new goal or new vision or something that really predicts how hopeful we stay throughout these kind of major life events and major challenges. Um, I was speaking and doing some interviews with kids um, or teens, and they talk about how low in hope they are, just that they, the kids they work with have no hope. Um, and yet the one thing I felt really positive about is they said, and I said to them, well, do you know, how do you, how do you define hope and how do you define hopelessness? Cause they know hopelessness is very strong as well. And they identify with hopelessness and yet they don't really know how to define it. And I said, well, once you define it, what if we can teach you it and teach it to you? And they found this really exciting that they can start to understand what hopelessness even is. And that they can start learning how to get out of that hopelessness to hope. So it was really promising from a youth perspective in terms of potential to even just help starting to get them these tools, how to manage their stress proactively. Um, but it's been such a hard time on that, on that age group for sure. Um, and I've seen that as well. Well, I think, um, it's, been, I think it's been difficult, Catherine, across all age groups. I think from the elderly uh, down to the very young, I think there's no age group actually that has escaped the impact of uh, COVID, in other words, which again makes it unique. In other words, uh, uh, often the traumas that have been experienced have been uh, focused on one group or another and some group has been spared. Um, but with the COVID pandemic, uh, uh, no one has been spared. In other words, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's true. What what did you learn? Um, so when you worked with Dr. Joseph Murray and he did the first, he was a Nobel Prize winning physician, he did the first human transplant and he dealt with a lot of people in very challenging situations. Um, that Can you share a little bit about how he practiced through the use of hope, no matter kind of what people were experiencing? Sure. Catherine's referring to uh, Dr. Joseph Murray, who won the Nobel Prize for uh, kidney transplantation. But actually, he did he did a lot of work with head and neck cancer, and the people had a very very bad prognosis. Okay, uh, but uh, he never ended up talking to individuals about their prognosis. Uh, he really uh, the news he would have had to deliver would have been bad news. So he always talked to the people about what was the next procedure? What can we do next? Uh, and in essence, what he was doing was giving people hope that there was a next procedure, uh, uh, whether he believed it or not. I, actually, I think he did believe it, in other words, but uh, this was his way. He was not a psychiatrist, uh, uh, but he was intuitively, psychologically very attuned uh, to what individuals facing uh, terrible situations need to deal with. So what would you suggest we face, that we that we kind of look to next as a next step, as a, you know, as a world moving forward post-COVID? I, I think that uh, there's a real challenge to leadership, in other words, to offer hope in other words, in concrete ways. So uh, the same way you have a hope curriculum, I would hope that leaders would develop a, a more global governmental hope curriculum. Uh, one, no, I'm serious. Uh, uh, one that offered the kinds of uh, concrete support that people could, uh, uh, could count on, uh, that people could rebuild trust in institutions uh, and in leadership. In other words, and in science, in other words, uh, uh, so there's a lot of work to be done uh, uh, by leaders, not simply in the mental health community. In other words, the mental health community can help uh, uh, by picking up the pieces and trying to do what it can uh, to provide some input into some of these initiatives. Uh, uh, but everybody is going to have to be involved and engaged in uh, uh, building good mental health. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I think Happy we're to off to our next speaker, but so helpful and a really great global perspective on what's happening and the impact and what we can do moving forward. So wonderful to have you. Thank you so much.
Well, thank you, Catherine. Thank you for the World Happiness Fest. Absolutely. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.